Acute respiratory infections in young children affect the respiratory system. Nose, ears, throat, larynx, trachea, bronchi, and lungs. Pneumonia is the most deadly respiratory infection. In the year 300 before the Common Era, the founder of modern medicine, Hippocrates, described the symptoms as high fever, aching, cough, and phlegm. When pneumonia is at its height, the case is beyond remedy, he declared. In 1875, the Swiss German physician Edwin Klebs was the first to observe bacteria in the airways of people who had died of pneumonia. But the link between the bacteria and the illness was still unclear. In 1882, German doctor Karl Friedlander identified two bacteria responsible for pneumonia, thanks to a new technique still used today, gram staining. One was Streptococcus pneumoniae, or pneumococcus. In 1918, pneumonia eclipsed tuberculosis in the pantheon of killer diseases. Canadian Dr. William Osler branded it Captain of the Men of Death. During the second half of the 20th century, thanks to the discovery of antibiotics that started with penicillin, modern surgical techniques, and intensive medical care, Pneumonia recovery rates increased considerably and mortality dropped sharply in developed countries. In the 1970s, the first vaccines against pneumococcus further decreased the number of people contracting the disease in developed countries. In 1977, immunization of adults began, followed by children in 2000. In 1988, vaccination was initiated against the second most dangerous bacteria, Haemophilus influenzae type B, or Hib. While Hib vaccination exists almost everywhere in the world, pneumococcus vaccine is expensive and not easily accessible to poorer people. In 2013, pneumonia killed almost one million children under the age of five years. <laughs> The most deadly of acute respiratory infections, pneumonia is the leading cause of death in under five-year-olds. 3,000 children die of pneumonia every day. In 2010, half of all victims lived in Africa and 40% in South Asia. A handful of countries account for half of the children who die of pneumonia or diarrhea. India, Nigeria, Democratic Republic of Congo, Pakistan, and Ethiopia. Many factors trigger or exacerbate pneumonia. For example, malnutrition. An undernourished child is six times more likely to contract the disease. Poor indoor air quality also increases susceptibility to the disease. In Sub-Saharan Africa, 80% of the population still use wood or coal to cook food. Even if in the past 10 years the annual number of deaths has been almost halved, treatment is not always universally available. Most types of pneumonia can be treated easily with antibiotics. But in less developed countries, less than a third of children have access to them. In Asia, less than one in five. And in Africa, less than one in three. Access to immunization also varies. In 2011, only 40% of people in poor countries were vaccinated against pneumococcus, compared to 75% in rich countries. However, a vaccine against another pneumonia bacteria, Hib, offers some hope. At the end of the 1990s, the Hib vaccine was almost non-existent in poor countries. Thanks to the support of the UN, although it is relatively expensive, 
Hib vaccine is used extensively throughout the world. <laughs> there are two types of respiratory infections, those of the upper respiratory tract and those of the lower respiratory tract, like pneumonia, which affects the lungs. Many different microorganisms, bacteria, viruses, fungi, can trigger pneumonia. But two bacteria in particular cause the most severe infections. Streptococcus pneumoniae, or pneumococcus, and Haemophilus influenzae, type B. Most of the time, these bacteria are already present in children's noses and throats. When the immune system is weakened due to malnutrition or infections like HIV, the bacteria seize the opportunity to pass through the body's defense barrier, the mucous membrane, and the infection reaches down into the lungs. The lungs are made up of tubes called bronchi. Like the branches of a tree, the bronchi branch off into smaller respiratory tracts, the bronchioles. At the end of each bronchiole are alveoli, tiny air sacs with very thin walls. It's the alveoli that allow oxygen to pass into the blood and carbon dioxide to be released. When the bacteria arrive in the lungs, they settle in the alveoli. The body reacts and dispatches its army of white blood cells to destroy the invaders. Fluids accumulate at the bottom of the alveoli. White blood cells, residue of destroyed bacteria, and live bacteria which continue to multiply. The fluids create a kind of barrier that prevents oxygen passing into the bloodstream and the release of carbon dioxide. The alveoli can no longer do their job. The first symptoms kick in. Fever, a sign that the body is fighting inflammation. And a cough, a reflexive reaction to the presence of fluid in the lungs. With severe infections, particularly common in young children, the chest retracts as they inhale and breathing becomes difficult. In the worst case scenario, the lung tissue dies, which leads to generalized infection and respiratory distress. If left untreated, severe pneumonia is almost always fatal. <laughs> In many countries, to diagnose respiratory infections, such as pneumonia, doctors take an x-ray of the lungs and do laboratory tests. But these techniques are rarely available in poor countries, where pneumonia is most deadly. Pneumonia is caused by multiple pathogens bacteria and viruses and the treatment can be completely different depending on the cause. In 2011, Fondation Merieux launched a multi-center study in nine countries on three continents to improve identification of the causes of pneumonia. We set up molecular diagnostic facilities that can detect 19 different viruses and five different bacteria in each sample. By identifying the pathogen, we can improve treatment basing it on the diagnosis. And based on the pathogens we find, we can improve existing vaccines and find other potential vaccines for countries where pneumonia is the main cause of mortality. For more than 10 years, there has been a vaccine against pneumococcus, 
the most common bacterial cause of pneumonia. The most recent vaccine, PCV13, reduces pneumococcal infections by 80 to 90 percent. But because it's expensive, most poor countries have yet to include it in their immunization programs. The bacteria that cause respiratory infections are becoming more and more resistant to antibiotics. To find solutions to combat these antibiotic-resistant bacteria, we are now developing the use of bacteriophages, which are viruses that have this notable characteristic that they only infect bacteria. Bacteriophages are very common in nature. We find them more or less everywhere, in the air, in the water, or in the ground. The fact that they are so common means they're responsible for renewing the bacterial populations on the surface of the Earth. Based on experiments that we've carried out, we've shown clearly that bacteriophages can be administered by an aerosol spray, which could be used as a direct application to treat pneumonia. One of the advantages of bacteriophages is that they are very selective. Each type of bacteria can be infected by specific bacteriophages. As a treatment, bacteriophages will attack the problematic bacteria and won't touch the other bacteria. This is different from other antibacterial strategies. In intensive care units, for example, we know that pneumonia is quite common. Nowadays, these pneumonias are caused by antibiotic-resistant bacteria. So bacteriophages could be a solution for these patients. In the laboratory, we've been trying to move ahead with treatment for these patients by isolating specific bacteriophages for the bacterial strains found in these pneumonias. Using models, we can test the effectiveness of bacteriophage sprays to treat pneumonias. Aerosols allow precise administration of the bacteriophages to the center of the infected site and facilitate diffusion into the lungs, which will help to treat the episode of pneumonia rapidly. In five to ten years, we hope that bacteriophages will be one of the possible treatment options against bacterial infections. A large number of laboratory tests have already been carried out showing their efficacy and safety. Now it's time to move on to clinical trials so that patients can start to benefit from this treatment.